Welcome to the Global Harmonization Initiative webinar series. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Diana Bogiva and I'm the GHI Working Group Director. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar discussing issues of chemical food contamination. It is hosted by the GHI Chemical Food Safety Working Group and will explore a specific issue of uh, heat-induced toxicants, uh, oil oxidation products and mycotoxins. Uh, food chemical contamination is uh, really a general problem that arises either by natural means or through processing, heating of food. Uh, heating as a process for making food uh, more safe and palatable, we all know that uh, is, uh, is a good uh, way to do this. But this can also cause problems, especially if it is used excessively. We'll hear all about this today. Uh, in this second GHI webinar, we'll have three fascinating speakers, uh, Professor Dr. Mikhail Markovic, uh, co-chair of GHI Chemical Food Safety Working Group and associate uh, professor from Institute of Biochemistry Functional Food Group at Graz University of Technology, Austria, who will explore the oxidation products produced by heat and sunlight. We'll have also Professor Doris Marco, from the Department of Food Chemistry and Toxicology at the University of Vienna, Austria, uh, who immerse us uh, in the world of mycotoxins, talking about mycotoxins in the food chain from aflatoxin to emerging contaminants. And also we have uh, Associate Professor Dr. Franco Pedreschi, a co-chair of GHI Chemical Food Safety Working Group and associate professor at the Department of Chemical and Bioprocess Engineering at uh, Pontificio Catholic University in Chile, who will reveal for us the potentially toxic compounds uh, formed by excessive heat treatment of food. Please welcome our speakers together with them and you, our audience, will discover the many issues that arise around chemical food contaminations. Another welcome uh, is for you, our valuable audience. Uh, we are delighted to have you with us today. Uh, we will give you a task to do, a um, special poll session. And also, please, if you have any questions for our speakers, put them in the Q&A function. We endeavor to answer as many of those questions as possible in the time available. And I believe together we are going to learn a lot from today's webinar. Thank you, ICC, for providing the platform to enable this most important conversation. Uh, thank you for the help. Um, this goes to Dr. Gerhard Schleining and Dr. John Tank, who will collate and present the results from our interactive poll during the webinar. Now, let me welcome and introduce our first speaker, Professor Mikhail Markovic. He is a co-chair of GHI uh, Chemical Food Safety Working Group and associate professor of Institute of Biochemistry Functional Food Group, Graz University of Technology, Austria. Michael research focus on broad uh, um, areas from biotechnology development and improvement of uh, fermentation processes and production of fungal metabolic animal cell cultures. Current research focus on toxicologically relevant substances uh, are formed during heating of food and how this uh, could be reduced. Michael, thank you for being with us today and it's over to you now. Thank you, Diana, for this uh, nice introduction. So welcome uh, everybody who is listening uh, to my presentation and I will talk about oil oxidation in this case and uh, maybe also give you an idea why oil oxidation might be a problem to our health. So the reason why we started to investigate oil oxidation uh, were a few publications that were appearing uh, during the last decades. And uh, I have selected just two of them because they, they might be show what, what topic is interesting. And uh, in this publication from 2003, uh, it was uh, stated, as you can read here, that uh, dietary consumption of heated oils may lead to oxidative damage and to cell death in the colon. This may contribute to the enhanced risk of colon cancer due to regenerative, regenerative cell proliferation. So 
Here, and there's also other evidence that we have an increased risk of colon cancer after consumption of oxidized oils. And the second publication, which is also interesting, is this here from 2013. And here we can see that there is a relation of uptake of uh, oxidized lipids from food with uh, uh, inflammation of the liver. So they, they state that the present data suggests that the ingestion of uh, peroxidized linoleic acid is much more effective than unperoxidized in evoking pro-oxidant and pro-inflammatory processes in the liver. So this should uh, identify the relation of uptake of, of oxidized lipids with uh, what is commonly known as non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So with this background, we started to investigate uh, oil oxidation and uh, I will show some data now how this oil, uh, what happens to the oil when you are not taking care, when you expose it to light and when you expose it to oxygen or at uh, higher temperatures. What is well known and I would say is more or less common sense is the oxidation of oils, which is a radical reaction. Uh, in this case, this example I show here is the uh, uh, one of the possibilities of oxidation of linolenic acid. Uh, where you see here that one hydrogen is abstracted, we have the remaining electron here, and then we have a rearrangement of the double bonds forming uh, conjugated double bonds, then the addition of oxygen with another uh, free radical electron here, and this electron or this uh, radical oxygen takes hydrogen from another lipid, for example, forming a hydroperoxide. What is quite interesting here is that you can just follow it. When you look in the photometer, you can follow this reaction because the generation of the double bond can be observed at 235 nanometers, showing that uh, this oxidation is uh, proceeding somehow. We have different kinds of oxidation products and one of them is uh, another one is shown here and you see we have this peroxyl radical here and this can react intermolecularly forming this epidioxide here leaving another electron radical radical electron here which adds oxygen and hydrogen from another fatty acid so we get this hydroperoxy epidioxide. And the third interesting compound that we have is uh, that this hydroperoxide, as shown here, can be cleaved with one, uh, where one hydroxyl radical is uh, split off with one remaining electron and the oxygen here. And this again can react intermolecularly forming an epoxide. So we have now several possibilities of uh, the so-called uh, formation of uh, primary oxidation products of fatty acids. And uh, this can react further forming what we can then smell, forming aldehydes and ketones, uh, which give the typical rancid smell like the, like the hexanal, hexanal, heptanal, heptanal very typical oxidation products that can be smelled and which give this typical rancid aroma to the oils. How can we investigate this? And uh, I, let's say the most easiest way is to use uh, MS and with the uh, fragmentation of the triglycerides and the oxidized triglycerides, we can clearly identify which of the fatty acids is oxidized and at which position it is oxidized and which fatty acid is at which specific location in the triglyceride. And this is very interesting because you can use mass spectrometry with a few additional rules, which I will show you in a minute, to identify which fatty acid is located at which position in the triglyceride. So you see this very few rules here which help us to identify the position of the fatty acid. And you see the fatty acids which are less abundant are normally esterified at the position three. 
In plant oils, you will normally not find palmitic acid in the central position. And the third very important rule is that the position one and position three, uh, we have a higher probability of cleaving of a fragmentation of these fatty acids. So the uh, position two is more stable than position one and three. And when applying these rules, you can easily identify or characterize the triglycerides with mass spectrometry. To distinguish between the position one and three, which is not very easy, uh, you might need additional methods and uh, you might need the help of specific enzymes, which are cleaving uh, position one, position three, or which are uh, specific uh, enzymes uh, distinguishing between R and S configuration of the triglycerides. Good. For chromatography, we used a very simple method, isocratic elution with isopropanol, uh, with an isopropanol methanol mixture, which gives a very good separation of the triglycerides. And for the mass spectrometry, uh, we have added some ammonia to get uh, positive, to get the positive ionization in the, in the, the during the electrospray ionization. So looking at the MS data, the single quadrupole MS, we, we did not, for these experiments that I show you here, we did not use a triple quad MS. We used a single quadrupole, and this also gives enough information to identify all these compounds that I will show you. So we have the triglyceride with the most prominent peak at 849, which is the ammonium adduct. And then we get fragments. Uh, in this case, where we have palmitic, linoleic, and palmitic acid, so we have a double palmitic acid derivative, and we have a palmitic linoleic derivative, and uh, there's no third possibility. In the case of palmitic linoleic and oleic acid, we have three possible fragments that are shown here, and you see that all these three fragments are uh, different in mass. And sometimes we have the same mass, depending on the fatty acids, and, in, uh, and if there are different fatty acids, we have different masses. And by this fragmentation pattern, we can uh, identify the triglyceride, which is the molecule that is analyzed here. Chromatography looks like this. You see very nice separation of most of the, or at least in this case, the separation of uh, standard GSL glycerols, uh, linolenic, triple linoleic acid, and with oleic acid, so we see different mixtures, and here we have a saturated fatty acid, the stearic acid. So the separation is good, uh, the uh, ionization is good, and then we can start analyzing oils. And I have just three examples of oils here, which are not oxidized. So we have the unoxidized oils here. So in, in this part of the chromatogram, we have the triglycerides, and you can see they are identified here with these numbers. We could identify the triglycerides. And in this part of the chromatogram here, we see the diglycerides only with two fatty acids. And this part here are the monoglycerides. And th this is general for all the oils that you've analyzed. This is corn oil. We have the same, uh, we have sunflower oil here, and we have rapeseed oil as examples, uh, just to see how the chromatograms look like, uh, in this case with UV detection. When we look at the mass spectra from the single quadrupole, we get, of course, we get the molecular ion peak here with ammonia. Uh, we get the, uh, molecular ion, which is protonated, and we have the sodium adduct here, so we can see all the three main molecular ions with different positive charges here. So when you fragment three linoleic acid, you see that uh, only one fragment is appearing because you just cleave off one linoleic acid and two are remaining, and all these uh, fragments have the same molecular mass. When we have, as example here, we have palmitic acid and two oleic acids here, we have two fragments here, 
which are uh, distinguished by the mass palmitic acid has, as you can see here, 16 units less than the D oleic acid. Derivative and another example is here, where we have uh, oleic acid, linoleic acid, linolenic acid, which are distinguished only by the number of double bonds. So we have one double bond here, three double bonds in linolenic acid and two double bonds in linoleic acid, which is reflected in the mass spectrum and the fragments that you can see here. So the difference is very small, 599, 601, 597 for these three fragments. But even with this relatively low resolution in the MS, we easily can distinguish all these fragments. And a fourth example is here. We have palmitic acid, linoleic acid, and oleic acid. Again, we have the molecular ion here, and we have palmitic and oleic acid, 577, which is the smaller peak here. We have the palmitic linoleic acid here, and the linoleic acid and oleic acid here, which has a little bit bigger mass due to the longer chain length of the carbon backbone in the fatty acids. Good, let's see how we can identify the oxidized fatty acids with this technique. And this is a little bit more complex, as you can see here, because using this uh, interpretation of the mass spectra, we now can identify which fatty acid is at which position in the triglyceride which fatty acid is oxidized, because the fragment shows also with the, with the increased mass, the status of oxidation. And now what we can see here is that we get a fragmentation specific here, for example, on this side. And this means that cleaving at this position identifies the position of oxidation here. So with this kind of fragmentation, we can identify if the double bonded position nine is oxidized and so on. So we and we, we can see if it is a hydroperoxide, if it is an epidioxide or if it's an epoxide. And you can imagine that in this case, the fragments become a little bit more complex, but independent of the complexity, we still have enough resolution to identify each of these fragments. And we have to direct our parameter of the ionization and of the fragmentation in the mass spectrometer to see which kind of uh, product, how we can interpret the mass spectra to identify which triglyceride and which oxidized triglyceride is present in the oil. So, when we talk about mass spectrometry and electrospray mass spectrometry, this is some kind of low-tech MS. So we did not use high-resolution MS or other uh, high-resolution orbit trap or whatever. So with a single quadruple, we can use this only for interpretation. Good. We have, as a conclusion here, as a first conclusion, it's quite interesting, we can separate the triglycerides. However, the chromatographic separation is difficult because we have so many different triglycerides and the compounds are very similar, but still, as you, when you remember, we have a nice separation of many of the triglycerides. In addition, when we use mass spectrometry, we have a clear identification of the triglycerides, even if we do not separate it by liquid chromatography. And the fragmentation allows us to identify epoxides, hydroperoxides, endoperoxides, and the position of the oxidation. So now we try, the idea is to reduce oxidation by adding antioxidants. And I had just one example here. We were looking at uh, carotenoids, how we can reduce oxidation by adding carotenoids. And before I go to the results, we, we will, uh, we have to know that oxidation at room temperature and oxidation at higher temperatures is a little bit different, is a different chemistry. And we have observed that practically all antioxidants, which work quite well at room temperature, 
tend to be pro-oxidative at higher temperatures. So this is the oxidation path of beta-carotene and we compared carotenoids without oxygen, so carotenes, and uh, we have another example of exanthophyll, which contains oxygen, uh, which gives a different reaction. Uh, and we tested astaxanthin, for example, in this case here. So we see the oxidation of the oil, the peroxide value here is the control. And you see that we have here an increased peroxidation formation of peroxide uh, when we add uh, beta carotene, for example. So this gives us some kind of pro oxidative effect. Uh, and uh, what I have to say to this experiment, it's not mentioned here, is that we did this experiment uh, at higher temperatures. So at 110 degrees, where we can standardize oxygen transfer, where we can standardize the temperature, we can control exactly the temperature. So this is done at 110 degrees. And you see here the degradation of beta carotene going down to after 10 hours, it's completely oxidized beta carotene. And then uh, here when beta carotene is oxidized, the oxidation starts. Good, very similar experiment. We have here in corn oil at 110 degrees, we have oxidized beta carotene in this machine that controls oxygen transfer and that controls the temperature, which, which is very important to have reproducible parameters. In our experiments, very similar here in corn oil. So when you compare the, the real food oils with standardized oils, so we get a very similar situation that uh, the beta carotene is oxidizing, or is, is a pro-oxidant in this experimental system. Okay. Then uh, when we look at the uh, beta carotene, there is one interesting point we see here. This is the beta carotene as it is used in uh, for the experiment. And we see here the isomers, the double bond isomers. We have the or E configuration, and then we have here several C configurations. Uh, and the first reaction that is occurring at higher temperatures is the isomerization of the beta carotene. And you see a significant increase, in the formation of the uh, double bond isomers here. And then we have the oxidation products here, which contain oxygen somehow. So we can follow this by using UV detection, uh, interpreting the UV absorption, absorption spectra because they have all specific absorption maxima and this can be compared with the MS data and we have with the uh, UV absorption, we get uh, very clear results on the oxidation of beta carotene. Good, you see here, uh, on here we have the maximum absorption, which is related to the uh, UV absorption or in the visible absorption spectrum here. And we have the molecular ions here as well. So this can then be used for interpretation of the beta carotene oxidation products. Very similar here, we compare uh, the oxidation of uh, beta carotene and astaxanthin. And in this case here, beta carotene is less stable. Uh, astaxanthin, which contains oxygen, is more stable here. And this is also reflected in the formation of the peroxides. We analyzed the peroxide value by titration with iodine. And uh, this uh, circles are the control, it's the control experiment. We have a delayed oxidation with astaxanthin and we have a, a, a stronger oxidation in the presence of in the presence of beta carotene. Good, so here, now we can, this is more or less the end of my presentation and uh, we have the methods now to characterize the oils. We have the methods to characterize the oxidation products of antioxidants. In this case, as I showed here is the, uh, uh, some examples of, of carotenoids. Uh, what has to be done and what we do not yet know in detail is when we remember the two publications that I mentioned at the beginning of these presentations, what 
presentation, what we do not know is which of the compounds are responsible for the effects. And this has not been evaluated at the moment. Uh, so let's say this is some kind of future research where we have uh, to do to put more work on identification of the substances which are responsible for these health effects. So with this, I want to thank you for your interest and I want to thank for the possibility to present some of our results and to show you one of the issues that uh, we have with food contamination in relation to health. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much much uh, Mike, uh, Michael. Um, one question I have for you, uh, you mentioned uh, oleic uh, acid. Uh, it's used actually in, um, as a component in many foods. Uh, I think yes. it was um, as an omega-9 fatty acids, uh, yeah. yes. as long as I'm aware of. But, but how dangerous is the oxidation in our food? Uh, you mentioned the risk of colon cancer, liver inflammation. Uh, what we have as a consumer needs to be aware of and yes. trying to avoid yeah they let's say if we reduce exposure to oxidized oils mm. we reduce the risk we do not know in detail how big is the risk of oxidized oils in relation to cancer or in relation to liver disease this is one point the other point is oxidized oil doesn't taste very nice mm. as you know so uh, and when we think a good mark uh, we to look for, yeah, yeah. Uh, when we th when you, you were mentioning oleic acid, oleic acid is is the is one of the acids which is more stable compared to to the more unsaturated fatty acids like the linoleic acid or linoleic acid or even the fish oil, the DHA and and EPA. So the highly unsaturated omega-3 fatty acids. So with this, we have to be very careful. We have to be careful that especially the, the fish oil fatty acids that we have and the omega-3 fatty acids, this has to be protected for two reasons. One is the oxidation leading to some health issues. Mm -hmm. And the other one is that if the, uh, the uh, omega-3 fatty acids are oxidized, we don't have it for our metabolism and we don't have this beneficial effect what is related to the omega-3 fatty acids for example yeah so oleic acid is stable but the highly unsaturated fatty acids are not stable and they are very easily oxidized thank you very much because we advance with the time uh, if you have any questions this is for our audience please write them at uh, the q a box there and uh, we'll go to our next speaker but before this uh, our first uh, interactive poll the question is uh, which of the following toxin do you think is most detrimental for human health i'm launching it so please give us your answers and the results will be displayed after you finish thank you so uh, quickly, you have uh, this result display, 30% uh, synthetic food additive, 41% uh, toxic produced uh, in a byproduct, and 11% natural toxins found in plants, and 90% toxins form as a result of uh, food processing. Um, Michael, do you think that these are objective results? Uh, maybe yes, but... Uh... Uh, maybe we will wait. We will have to wait for the presentation of Doris. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> which okay. might be another big issue, or which is another big issue in uh, relation to food safety. Yeah. So with this, uh, we continue with our next speaker today, uh, Professor Dr. Doris Marco. She is a professor of food chemistry at the Department of Food Chemistry and Toxicology at the University of Vienna, Austria and head of the Department of Food Chemistry and Toxicology. Uh, she um, synergistically combines uh, both field uh, state-of-the-art analytics with toxicological mechanistical approaches to address uh, pressing questions on consumer safety. Uh, this is all of you, our audience. Uh, thank you for joining us today and uh, over to you, Doris.
Okay, so welcome everybody and, and thank you very much uh, that I have the possibility to, um, to talk about my most uh, favorite uh, topic, um, mycotoxins today in that webinar. So, well, I, I could uh, talk a whole semester about mycotoxins, but I have to bring uh, the information in a nutshell. So, and this is what we will do, uh, I try to do today. So, from uh, a global perspective, my, mycotoxins represent the most frequently occurring natural food contaminants. And this is true despite of real substantial improvements in, in good agricultural and manufacturing practices. And uh, mycotoxins occur worldwide in animal diets, but also in the, in the food chain for humans. So contamination might occur on the field, after harvest, or upon inadequate storage. And the, the organisms responsible are different in the different stages of these processes. So we, on one hand, do have a whole spectrum of fungi. And these fungi, well, they don't want, want to poison humans. They want to have um, a weapon against uh, other organisms which compete for food. So they generate a whole spectrum of secondary metabolites. So the most prominent organisms well known are Aspergillus, Fusarium, and Perusinium. Uh, penicillium species. So mycotoxins are as old as, as the human history. And one of the first documented uh, um, uh, descriptions arise from the Bible already. And in medieval ages, um, mycotoxins in the form of intoxication with um, so-called ergot alkaloids were kind of famous and very famous painters like uh, the Bruegel brothers, for example, or Martin Grunewald. Um, they described uh, respective intoxication with ergot alkaloids leading to gangrene and the loss of um, uh, feet, uh, limbs, and, and, and uh, hands, for example. And well, in that time, we everybody thought this is a kind of uh, um, some holy stuff or demons. Uh, Saint Anthony's fire uh, was uh, one term found for that. But this is not only history. This is a picture from Styria, a region uh, where, uh, for example, uh, Michel Murkovic uh, um, is living. So in 2013, we saw these uh, structures in, in Ray. Um, so these are still present, but nowadays we can sort them out and, and this is hopefully more or less solved. So the real history, the toxicological history for modern science and mycotoxin research started in the 1960s with a famous Turkey X disease where about 100,000 turkeys had to be killed or, or died due to intoxication arising from the consumption of spoiled peanut cake. And what came out in the end uh, was um, the famous aflatoxin B1, a contaminant arising from um, spoilage with Aspergillus flavus. And then, then, well, in the 1960s, we could detect about, well, up to six compounds by analysis, by liquid uh, um, chromatography and respective uh, analysis. Nowadays, we are up to, well, there are methods uh, established detecting secondary metabolites uh, up to 1500 in, in one run. So, but that makes our life not always very easy. <laughs> so what is nowadays uh, really monitored on a regular basis in the EU and regulated with uh, uh, respective upper limits, a short list is shown here. And on the top, of course, the famous aflatoxins. I will have some words a little bit later. And But this is a kind of a short list. So this is not so long and I will show you that there are some concerns about uh, that there are so many other metabolites out there. But what is very obvious is that many of these metabolites are formed by so-called fusarium species and this is something very special. And 
These compounds are now well known. We know how they are formed, how they are generated, but they still occur in food. And I will demonstrate for some of the most um, important compounds, what is their way of action. And let's start with the most famous one, the aflatoxin. This is aflatoxin B1. And we are all well aware that in mammalian organisms, um, and not only in, in, in rats and mice, but also in mice, in, in humans, um, uh, aflatoxins, and especially aflatoxin B1, contributes to the induction of liver cancer. But there's much more about that. There's discussion whether um, early life exposure and in utero exposure might contribute to stunting, uh, which is uh, in, in many countries still uh, a very important issue in the, in, in, in the delayed development of, of the children. And unfortunately, aflatoxins um, uh, have a very uh, unfortunate synergism with um, HPV infection, which might um, lead to synergistic effects for the onset of, for the induction of liver cancer. Where do we find aflatoxins? They are very famous for contamination of oil seeds, um, groundnuts, pistachios, almonds, figs, but, but also many cereals, maize. And aflatoxins have all, always been considered to be a topic uh, with respect to uh, regions uh, with high temperature and moisture. So is Europe at risk? Of course it is. On one hand, well, um, we expect um, that the temperature will rise now already in May in Vienna, uh, up to 30 degrees this week. And uh, that's one point. So climate change will, uh, we have to pay a price already here with respect to different pattern of growth um, of these type of organisms and the uh, occurrence of respective toxins. And of course, our trading pattern is completely different nowadays. So there's a global um, distribution of all kinds of, of food. And, and so also um, aflatoxins might uh, come to many, many countries. So what are they doing? Aflatoxin B1 is one of the very well studied genotoxic carcinogens. So let's have a look at the structure. So there's that famous double bond in the structure between the carbon 8 and carbon 9. And this double bond is prone to oxidation by cytochrome P450, uh, P450 monooxygenases in our liver, leading to the formation of epoxide. And that very epoxide is eager to form DNA adducts, and they are very well known. And the most famous DNA adduct is adduct in the position of the N7 of guanine, as it is shown here. When we are a little bit lucky, um, then that adduct is destabilized and gets removed from the, from the sugar, and we have an aporinic site. That is only a little bit of a damage. The more persistent and real mutagenic damage occurs when that um, five ring is opening to the so-called form amidopyrimidine DNA adduct, which is very stable and extremely mutagenic. And the, that process leads to very characteristic mutations. So we know that there is a very, uh, very often targeted codon in the P450 gene uh, affected in codon 249. And very uh, high risk regions in the world have been identified, for example, um, a region in, in China, in Guidong, where um, a high incidence of um, primary liver cancer um, is always noted. And that is genotoxic carcinogen in the liver, aflatoxin B1 still a topic and with climate change we will have to expect more of these compounds to be formed. A completely different compound is ochratoxin A. Ochratoxin A has a completely different target. 
it targets the kidney and it is formed under moderate climate conditions, found in a huge variety of, uh, of, of goods, cereals, but also grapes, raisins, coffee beans, cocoa beans, tea. And we know that if silage is uh, contaminated, there might be a carryover to the meat and respective products uh, um, like milk and so on. The structure is very unusual with an phenylalanine moiety. And interestingly, after decades of investigation, we know that ochratoxin A is nephrotoxic. It's clearly uh, generating kidney tumors in rodents. It's a probable human carcinogen. We know that it is immune suppressive and teratogenic, but up to now, we are still not really absolutely sure about the full understanding of the mechanism of action. That's weird, but we are still working on that. And um, nowadays we think that many, many factors come together. But the kidney damage is the predominant effect. And what is very astonishing with ochratoxin A, it easily reaches the bloodstream and it stays there, I don't want to say forever, but for a very long time. It binds to, to albumins and it has an extremely a slow elimination, which might might be days. And if you take up the stuff again and again, then you might have something like a steady state. And it also might enrich in lipid-rich tissue. So far for the aflatoxins, ochratoxin A. Now have let's have a glimpse on the famous fusarium toxins. So, well, in in the 1980s, FAO uh, estimated that up to 25% of, of all cereals might, might be contaminated with mycotoxins. Up to now, with all sensitivity that we have now achieved with our analytics, the actual estimations go up to 90% um, of containing at least trace amounts of mycotoxins. If that's toxicological relevant, that's a different point, but, but they are omnipresent. And they might be present in wheat, they might be present in corn. So, and the very famous trachotisins, so one of these are T2 and HT2 toxin, a very strange structure, commonly food, commonly found in wheat, maize, barley, and especially oats. So depending on, on the harvest year, um, sometimes from certain regions, oats can't be marketed because to the respective contamination levels. So trachotisins um, um, affect the, the plant on the field and, and therefore that makes the life for the analytics a little bit more difficult and I come to that in a moment. So very famous intoxications are connected to these compounds and one is connected also to war and to, yeah this is devastating so at that Point when I'm lecturing about this, uh, these toxins, I, I talk about Second World War, where, where Hitler Germany um, uh, went into Russia, and that was late in the year, and the harvest wasn't brought in yet, and uh, all the males had to go to 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 the war, and the remaining women and children had problems to bring in the field fruits and and then that was the year of the very early winter and then there are pictures available showing these uh, these poor women and children and trying to to remove um, the grains from uh, from below the the early um, winter snow and that made it uh, moldy and and watery and and led to devastating intoxication. So, and now we are at, well, we, I don't, we shouldn't talk about the devastating situation in Europe at the moment, so. Well, what, what do these toxins do? They in, induce vomiting, abdominal pain, uh, and followed by leukopenia, which might then also lead to, um, to death. What is also very often, and, and this is not in oats, but, but this is very, often found uh, in, uh, in, in, in wheat, for example, is deoxynivalinol. 
This is the, the cause of the so-called fusarium head blight. You see it's much lighter here, the structure. This is very characteristic. And you will find it here in the fields uh, if, uh, if the situation is allows a respective uh, inoculation. Um, because these fusarium species, they grow in temperate climate regions all over north, the northern hemisphere. And uh, the structure is uh, yeah, also quite related to T2 and H T2. And the mechanism of action is very outstanding now, completely different from what we've saw, seen for aflatoxins or ochratoxin A. This compound inhibits the protein biosynthesis at the ribosome. And that makes it terribly cytotoxic. And it it, it it is a real bad trigger, for example, for the intestinal layer. It's, uh, um, it, it leads to respective cell death. So complete different mechanisms of action. And we can make that uh, even broader. The second, uh, the next uh, type of uh, fusarium toxins and these are the last, that's the last big class of fusarium toxins which have been identified are fumonisins, completely different in structure. These long chains, a lot of, uh, of acid residues. And these uh, compounds um, now with a very different mechanism of action again, it disrupts the sphingolipid metabolism and that could affect the uptake of folate and cause neural tube defect in, in, preg in, in pregnant women. And it is also discussed to contribute to some types of cancer. So, and last but not least, I, with the mechanism of action, I also want to demonstrate that also from, my, from, from the field of mycotoxins, substantial um, impact with respect to endocrine disruption might arise. So very famous for that is Ciara Lenon, another fusarium toxin, which acts as a estrogen. And this represents a so-called microestrogen. So this is Ciara Lenon. And Ciara Lenon is prone not so much to oxidative metabolism, but to reductive metabolism. And it, if it is reduced, and this is alpha ciara lenol it's written here then you increase estrogenicity by the factor of about 60 so and um, this for example might occur in the gastrointestinal tract for example in pig and reproductive uh, problems for example in pig as one of the sensitive uh, species um, are very well known so now we have covered a whole spectrum of potential mechanisms what what these compounds might do so when you analyze now um, your potential contaminants is it sufficient to analyze the ones i've shown you that depends on whether some metabolism is involved and what we sometimes forget is not only humans or animals are able to have metabolism also plants have metabolism if they are still metabolically active. And that is true, is true when the, the fungus infects the plant on the field, when the plant can still react. So what is the plant doing then? I can demonstrate for deoxynivalinol. So the fusarium is infecting um, the, the plant, generates deoxynivalinol, and now the plant tries to detoxify that compound. So, and one possibility, a plant can't glucuronidate, but they can't. They, the plant is able to generate glucosides or sulfates. In order to make the compound more soluble and transport it to the vacuole, where it can be safely stored away. And that means if you eat then respective uh, product, you do not only eat the oxynivalinol, but also the glucoside or the sulfate. And that makes light, life much more complicated for the analyst. So this is well known for many, many mycotoxins. 
the generation of modified mycotoxins by plant metabolism. It might occur for the oxynivalinol, it might occur, for example, also for ciaralinone and for alpha ciaralinol, so for many compounds. And that also changed the kinetic within the mammalian organism. So let's go back to my list here. So I, I hope I could give you a short glimpse of what is really important still to control. We have analyzed uh, the metabolism in the plant. We have analyzed uh, the mechanism. Also with ochratoxin A, we are still, yeah, there are still open questions. But nevertheless, these compounds are omnipresent and we have to um, really monitor the development. Nevertheless, we now know today that the list is not so long, which is regulated and monitored, but more than 300 mycotoxins have been identified so far, but for the others, the data are not sufficient. And on our prime list, which can be very, very long, and we do not have time for 300 and more compounds, um, I will introduce to you the hot list for the emerging ones. So what are emerging mycotoxins? For these compounds, data on occurrence and toxicity and or toxicity are not sufficient to allow a comprehensive risk assessment and therefore really to derive respective uh, upper limits and, and set regulatory measures. So these compounds are not monitored or regulated, let's say yet. So. One word for the famous eniatines, uh, famous in a, in a way that many groups nowadays uh, try to contribute to risk assessment or risk characterization, that's more correct here. So there are these interesting structures with different uh, residues here, eniatine A, A1, and so on and so on. There, there's a much longer list available and um, bovaricine. Keep these compounds in mind, so we need them at the end of my lecture soon. And the second hot list comprises the so-called alternaria toxins. Alternaria toxins are generated by fun fungi um, belonging to black molds, and they are ugly guys because they do not generate one structure. They generate a broad spectrum of structure out of different um, with different backbones. And only a few of them are commercially available. Among these, alternariol, it's monomethyl ether, it's just a methyl group here added. They are the ones which are best studied. A tenuazonic acid uh, occurs in, in a lot of food items. And what uh, many toxicologists uh, um, are at the moment very eager to, to contribute here, is the characterization of the hazard coming from these compounds, perylene quinones. Unfortunately, most of these compounds are co not commercially available, and some of these do even bear natural epoxide residue, and they are very, very genotoxic. So what do we find in food, and what is relevant for exposure when you look into these alternaria toxins? So where do they grow? They grow on grains, on tomatoes, on, on carrots. You wouldn't eat that stuff if it looks like that. Yeah, well, but do you see black spots on dark fruits? No. So a survey in the US demonstrated that uh, in, in, in berries ready to eat, dark berries, in some supermarkets, up to 80% um, of the packages had uh, traces at least of alternaria toxins. But you wouldn't eat that one, but you wouldn't recognize whether tomatoes used to generate it, that your tomato sauce are contaminated or not. And that brought us to the point that we developed a multi-method for alternaria toxins as far as we could uh, uh, identify the single compounds. And that was a very nice study um, initiated my, by my colleague Benedict Ward and uh, Hannes Punscher was a PhD student in the time and they analyzed tomato sauce, sunflower oil and, um, and wheat flour to be inspired by such a nice dish. And you can easily see this is tomato sauce 
and you nearly see the whole spectrum, a lot of tenuosonic acid, alternariol, it's monomethyl ether, some of the sulfated stuff, um, which means the tomato was infected when the tomato was still metabolically active. You see toxins in the sunflower seed oil with a lot of tenuosonic acid and, and uh, also AOH and AME. And also you have the wheat flour on the list. And that means, the, well, it look, might look nicely, but you have to really ensure what is the quality of the material used to produce such a dish. So for all who are interested, um, these data have been published in Food Control. And let's have at the end of my lecture, a quick glimpse in the real, gust, real ugly um, perylene quinones with the epoxide. There are many groups saying, ah, they don't occur in food. Well, actually we found some. In, in, in an apple, that nice dark lesion, never eat dark lesions of your apple, we learned now. So here we found a huge amount of that ugly genotoxic compound and could clarify uh, clearly the structure here. So but what do we find in humans? And let me demonstrate that uh, quickly for breast milk. Um, so Benedict Ward did a very nice study together with our common PhD student, Dominic Brown. Um, and they uh, analyzed Austra uh, Austrian, not Australia, <laughs> Austrian breast milk samples. And what did we find? We found some bovaricine, an emergent mycotoxin, eniatine B, an emergent mycotoxin, eniatine B1, an emergent mycotoxin, Alternariol monomethyl ether and emergent mycotoxin, but also oflatoxin A and Ciara linon. I have to add that the levels were very low, but I think we really have to consider exposure levels of these emerging mycotoxins, which obviously co occur with the regulated ones. And please don't go home and say, oh, she said, do not breastfeed, do not breastfeed. That's wrong because we also analyzed um, um, infant food um, out of different sources, yeah? Wheat, belt, oatmeal, and so on. And looked into contamination levels uh, arising from different species. And also there you had in 90% of the infant cereal and 97 of the infant formula samples, at least trace levels of um, mycotoxins and many of them emerging mycotoxins. And I want to, to, to underline that these compounds co-occur. You do not have a sample with only one single toxin. So bringing that together, what I try to, to summarize here today. So despite all improvement in our good agricultural and good manufacturing practice, of course, many things have been improved, but don't forget contamination with mitotoxins is still an actual topic and it gets more and more important due to climate change because climate change will substantially change the occurring pattern. And mm -hmm. Please keep in mind, mycotoxins rarely occur as single contaminants. And in addition to the limited list of regulated ones, a spectrum of harmful fungal metabolites might also occur in food and feed. And for these emerging mycotoxins, we need urgently more data. And at the end, so what is the perspective? What are the future challenges? We really need to address this issue of climate change we have to consider not only one compound, but the whole exposome co-occurring contaminants. And we have to think beyond substance classes because they don't care that they are different class, but they occur together and might affect people in synergistic way. So not everything which looks nice uh, might be without contaminants, but I hope you still can enjoy your nice dishes if they are, um, uh, prepared out of a very nice material. Okay, that's from my side. I hope I could give you um, a certain overview and uh, thank you that I had the possibility to talk here today and I'm open to questions. Thank you, Doris. This was really, really great. Uh, so we uh, we still need to continue eating spaghetti bolognese <laughs> or anything.
I still do. <laughs> to breastfeed our kids <laughs> if we have to. Uh, I think that's, uh, yeah. But I was but, really surprised uh, what you presented about odds because uh, this trichotysis, if I... Yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the odds are like used for breakfast in many countries around the world and, and not only for breakfast, they're doing uh, different dishes and bars and whatever things. Uh, so, scary. Yeah, but but they are well controlled because it is an issue. It's and it, it is also a, a climate issue. If you have a very wet year um, and and you have a lot of of watering on the field, then there's more danger of uh, respective um, development. And uh, but that's well controlled because it is an issue and and you can't prevent it. It's just yeah. depending on the climate. Yeah. Um, one point to the to tomato sauce maybe. So we investigated so many ready to eat tomato sauce and, and all these kind of tomato cans things. Well, nowadays I only use fresh tomatoes for my sauce, I have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's so you're on my page. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry to say okay. so, but summer is coming, so we can use fresh tomatoes. Yeah, yeah. very, very good. So there are lots of questions about that uh, they need uh, to be answered. And also there are some questions for Mik uh, Mikhail uh, before this. So mm -hmm. I, will, I will go on a few of them. Uh, and uh, if you have more time, we will answer them at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, does that mean it's very possible to isolate other types of this mycotoxin in our part of the world where the study are not that keen? This is one of the questions. I'm not sure about which one this person refer. Yes, there are several possibilities. Of course, it's it's uh, always very nice if you have uh, a sophisticated LTMSMS equipment, maybe even higher resolution on your hand, because uh, then you can also maybe identify the compounds you do not have references for. But there are other possibilities. So for, for many compounds, there are more simple and at hand possibilities. You can, can uh, indeed for some of the regulated compounds, even analyze on the field quickly. So some strategies are, are really on the way to, to identify um, mycotoxins directly um, in, in the process. Yeah, another question. Uh, uh, while the advice affects uh, the potency of many mycotoxins uh, are not known precisely, the new German total diet study is designed to estimate human exposure to a range of mycotoxins. That's great, but you have to analyze it, no? So uh, that means it, it, these studies are fantastic, uh, the, uh, but on on one hand, you you only have what you what the people consume there, yeah, and you have yeah. to analyze the compounds, yeah, and you only will find what you analyze, what you look for. Yeah, and is it possible to co-regulate occurrence levels? It might be and and maybe that for some of, of of the compounds that might be necessary to do so yeah and yeah. and um, maybe that will be the way in the future yeah, yeah? another question another two i will give you quickly uh, are mycotoxin found in spices oh of course they do <laughs> of course that's that's, so that's be careful with your spices people <laughs> yeah, so, well, with, with spices, that's a very different thing because you have all the, the food fraud and you have the potential contamination. Uh, so, yeah, that's yeah. absolutely possible. How can mycotoxins biomarker study can be useful in developing regulations and exposure assessment of mycotoxins? Biomarker studies are, are very valuable um, and they are indeed uh, in use for 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 some when when the last um, aflatoxin uh, efsa opinion has been developed in 2020 respective biomarker studies have also been included in 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 that uh, opinion already unfortunately the there's a limited amount of bio respective good biomarker studies available but i i think it's a good way to go Thank you for now, Doris. Uh, this was a very nice presentation. Uh, uh, and we'll go quickly to our second poll. Which chemical contaminant uh, do you think uh, are, uh, you can see it uh, on the screen now, do you think that uh, will be the most difficult to harmonize the regulation for? 
please give us your answers. And by the time you are answering, uh, there were a few comments about the previous uh, uh, quiz, uh, which uh, one of uh, you uh, found a little bit misleading, as the toxins of fungi did not really fit into the categories as they are not uh, plants, nor are they commonly taught uh, as a microbiological, which are usually bacteria, if I understood correctly. Thank you for your answers. So 44% think that there is a mycotoxin, 37 all of the above, 15% heat-induced uh, toxicants such as uh, alkamide, uh, acrylamide, and 4% oil oxidation products causing ran rancidity. Okay, uh, do you think, Doris, these are the right answers? People got the message? I think it's okay. Yeah, I, I think you have uh, not only toxins in your food. I, I think that's fair. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, um, um, if we have more time at the end, we will answer more questions. And now we are going to our third and last speaker, which is uh, Professor Franco Pedeschi. Uh, because of the time difference, his presentation was recorded prior to the, our webinar today. Gerhard, could you please help us? Uh, uh, just a moment. I have to change the presenter. And by the time uh, uh, Gerhard is doing this, uh, there was a question about oxidation processes. Uh, this is for Michael. For the laying oxidation process, we have synthetic preservative, but nowadays uh, various side effects are reported. So do you think uh, now we have to find new alternatives with minimal or lesser side effects? Uh, this is uh, a a quick question uh, and quick answer, Mike, before we continue with uh, Franco's presentation, I can see it's ready now. Yeah, in the, uh, I mean, this is clear. If we uh, if we have some, let's say, some side effects, toxic effects, we have to replace uh, this. Uh, I think the topic is about food additives. And uh, when we want to protect the oils using antioxidants, uh, we, we have to take care that there are no toxic side effects. Yeah, this is, is yeah. absolutely key. Thank you very much. And uh, now continue with uh, Franco Pedresti. Our speaker today is Professor Franco Pedresti. He is a full professor of the Department of the Chemical Engineering and Bioprocesses of the Pontificia Universitat Cattolica de Chile. Uh, and uh, he is researching around uh, chemical food safety, computer vision applies to food technology microstructure and physical properties of foods. And uh, he also have edited uh, a book uh, which was specialized uh, in chemical food safety and health together with uh, Zuzana Cesarova. Uh, and uh, he have written more than 95 uh, publications and is recognized in recognized peer reviewed journal related to food science and technology. And uh, he uh, revisited uh, several scientific paper in prestigious journals. Welcome, uh, Dr. Pedreshti, and over to you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, well, uh, the title of, of the research I'm going to present is Potentially Toxic Compounds Formed by Excessive Heat Treatment of Food. Well, it is uh, important to say that as a result of the excessive heating during food processing, some potentially po uh, toxic compounds such as acrylamide, fluorine, heterocyclic amines, among others, could be formed and affecting the, the quality and the, sometimes the inequity, of the, uh, the inequity and safety of the foods. Among the issues I'm going to talk, touch in this uh, presentation are non-enzymatic browning. It's not like a uh, Meyer reaction. It's worth, to know, uh, it's worth to say that associated to excessive heat treatment of foods, there are a lot of uh, reactions, sensory attractive uh, attribute development, such as aroma, flavor, color, um, and complex reactions, formation of undesired compounds of, pro of food products as a result of uh, excessive heating. Here we, ha uh, here we have some 
indication of major reaction in which we we say that uh, major reaction is forming very high heating uh, unit operations such as baking frying for example and it has to be with sensorial attributes of foods and also with the neo contaminant formation of some compounds in foods as a result of sensorial attributes we could get different flavor, aroma, and color, and um, many, many times uh, consider acceptance. Yeah? And on the other side, in the formation of neocontaminants, we can have phenotoxicity, health risk, for instance. Uh, we we'll have some illustrations about the, the Maya reaction. Um, we have, uh, Toast of coffee, for example, in which we develop acrylamide, for instance, we have uh, an excessive uh, toasting of red in which places which are darker with a more uh, black color uh, indicates uh, places where ac uh, acrylamide accumulates. Um, we we'll have French fries in which uh, most of the acrylamide accumulates in the super in this in the surface. We have a uh, meat portions in which the surface is getting black due to the excessive cooking. Well, now we are going to talk to uh, firstly to about acrylamide, which is a Neocontaminant from uh, 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 neocontaminant uh, product. Um, it is formed about 120 Celsius degree uh, for the reaction of uh, an amino acid reducing sugar by Meyer reaction. It could be toxic by the nervous system, carcinogenic in some uh, testing animals of lab. Um, and it could be classified as a, such as probable cancer carcinogenic, but for ser for human being. Um, the most recent presentative foods that has acrylamide, fried potatoes, uh, potato chips have more potato, more acrylamide than French fries. Uh, we have también, we have also acrylamide in bread and cookies, in breakfast cereals, coffee, etc. Yeah. And it has been uh, discovered uh, almost 15 years ago. Well, here we have an, an scheme of the Maya reaction where we have to reduce in sugar reactive with the uh, asp uh, asparagine and as a result, the acrylamide is formation. This mechanism is about 90% of acrylamide formation in foods. We have different uh, kinds of food that can be formed in this way. You need uh, that uh, the, temper the, the temperature uh, occurs at uh, higher than 120 Celsius degree. And here we have a, a table showing uh, different uh, acrylamide content of different foods and how they are evolution at different uh, years. Yeah, uh, since uh, acrylamide formation depends on uh, precursors, uh, the quantity of precursors could change uh, uh, temporarily during all the year. And that's the reason why it could change. It could change also from uh, different countries since they use different recipes to, to produce the foods. Here you have an indication of how potato chips and french fries change during the year. And here you, as, as you can produce acrylamide, there are some methodologies to mitigate acrylamide and they are based principally in changing the process parameters, yeah? For example, the diminishing temperature using blanching solutions to remove uh, 
to remove uh, acryl to remove um, uh, acrylamide precursors such as by using microorganisms, the enzyme asparaginase, or genetic modification. So there are many ways to uh, reduce acrylamide, but the important thing here is not only to reduce, but also to uh, to keep the attractive sensorial attributes as good as possible in the final product while maintaining very, very low uh, acrylamide levels. Here we have the example of the enzyme asparagine in which if glucose and asparagine, which are uh, precursors, if they react without the enzyme, they will give acrylamide. But if we introduce the enzyme asparagine, asparaginase or acrylamide is the commercial name, we change the conformation of asparagine and as a result, it turns into aspartic acid and we avoid or we diminish considerably the formation of acrylamide. Here are some experiments done in, in my laboratory in which we made pan, we made bread, bread uh, Chilean bread, um, in which we have uh, acrylamide content versus asparaginase content. And we know that as we increase the asparaginase content, the acrylamide content of the bread diminishes considerably. So this is a very good technique because it has been proved that I can diminish uh, acrylamide formation by using the enzyme and the, there is no alteration of the um, sensorial uh, attractive uh, attributes. Well, this is another, this is a Chilean uh, product. Uh, this, this Chilean product was uh, done in, in, in our laboratory with our students as well. And um, we could, uh, this is a fried uh, dough that is sell uh, commonly in Chile, and we can diminish up to 85% of the acrylamide formation by using the enzyme, the enzyme asparaginase. Here we have another example. Is uh, we have a, it's a, a tree, a leguminous tree called uh, Tara, and this Tara has, uh, has some uh, seeds inside the plant and in which with these seeds we, we, can, we can obtain some galatonines uh, and it, it, 40 to 60 percent hydrolyzed tanninos. Yeah? With these tanninos we can uh, make a formulation for example with bread as well and we can diminish the formation of uh, as, uh, acrylamide. Here we have the acrylamide formation versus the concentration extract of Tara. We see that as the Tara concentration of Tara increases, we can diminish the acrylamide formation. We didn't see any change in sensory attributes except for the color, because the color tend to change to uh, a little purple. And in the picture in, in the in, in the picture in the below part we can see the uh, percentage of reduction by using this uh, this plant here we have another uh, the second uh, neoformant uh, substance that we are going to see here that is called uh, hydroxymethyl furfural it could be formed at above 55 degrees by the Maya reaction. Uh, and uh, is, uh, it, has, uh, it has formed in many uh, foods at uh, lower temperatures than acrylamides. Here, for example, uh, we have a, a, a juice which, is, which has been heating from zero to 200, and we can see how the uh, hydroxymethyl furfural increases progressively. And we come back to the Tara results, and when the Tara results, not only acrylamide 
reduced with increasing tarag extract. But also, when I increase the tarag extract, the hydroxymethyl furfural also, also diminish in the extract. So it has a two a double advantage. Here you can see uh, some pictures of the bread after being cooked with the with the tara with the tara extract, and you can see as well that as the you use more tara, the bread is more darker, and it tends to get a, a little purple. And the other important neuro, 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 neuro format contaminant is a furan. Furan is a form in in almost all, all the foods at very low at very low temperatures, yeah. Especially as well in very close or very good seal uh, foods, and is is a liquid of high volatility and lipophilicity. Uh, he used in the industries, in the chemical industry. And it's a carcinogenic of the group 2T uh, qualified by IRC. Well, here you can see the uh, scheme of formation of uh, uh, furan. Here is more, the, the scheme is much more complicated than the formation of acrylamide. Here you can form, you can form by, by, by different uh, ways. For example, you can buy by thermodegradation. You you can find, you can uh, you can uh, form by my reaction among carbohydrates, carbohydrates, amino acids, among thermooxidation of ascorbic acid and PUFAS. So it's more much more difficult to study furan because you have different options how to form it. And here there is like a plot of uh, to see approximately uh, the quantity of uh, furan in different foods. Uh, usually, canned foods has a lot of furan as well as canned fish, some snack chips, etc. Et and here you can see the furan according to different groups. For example, 80% of the consumption of furan in scholars are 80 per I are 30% uh, of all the consumption in scholars are potato chips. In the case of uh, babies, is uh, all the consumption is 100% uh, is uh, baby food, and in the case of old people is 90% given by crackers. Well, after giving this information, it's important to say that these compounds could be mitigated either by diminishing the critical precursors in the raw materials and or by inhibiting, inhibiting the head processing conditions which favor the reactions under which this products are formed. For instance, packing frying, use of enzymes, among others. My reaction is linked to attractive sensorial properties in heated products as well to this kind of product formation in many heated foods. Which is the relevance of foods about this? These types of products usually occur at low concentration when good practice cooking is applied. These products formation can be reduced in some cases where it is the main change to minimize them without affecting negatively the sensorial properties of the product. Selection of raw material is important as well as to select the optimal heating conditions or the cooking procedure. Normally, all these PCTs are formed as products of natural occurring reaction under heat during cooking. 
but I want to acknowledge uh, from the seed project who supports the, uh, the research. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot uh, for this presentation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Franco couldn't be with us. Uh, uh, there are a few more questions uh, that uh, need to be answered. If you uh, don't mind, I will ask them. Um, so people are fascinated by the mycotoxin seams. Uh, uh, how do you go about the generation of structure for the various toxins? Uh, either my, uh, Mikhail can answer or Doris, it's up to you. Yeah, well, um, that's, Depends on so for, for most of the compounds, uh, the structures is I have presented today, the structure is already known. But if we go for an unknown compound, um, we purify the compound until we have uh, available amounts for NMR analysis. And then we combine NMR and high resolution mass spectrometry. And uh, in the end, we, we come up then with, with the final structure. And, and based on the structure, we, we then can design respective. Uh, analytic um, approaches to to follow the compound or, or find the compound in different uh, material and matrices. Yeah, and maybe this is uh, last question that I have to ask you. Actually, is um, uh, call for uh, collaborations uh, of people from Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. uh, they are asking for collaboration for analyzing aflatoxins. Uh, they have severe issues with. Uh, spices, peanuts, and animal feeds in Ethiopia. Okay, so, well, um, with, with respect, when, when you have a, such a, a broad spectrum of, 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 of classical mycotoxins, um, we have a, a wonderful collaborator in, um, also in Austria, it's, it's in Toln, it's Professor Grifka, and they have in place a multi-method for a huge panel of, of respective mycotoxins. So our multi-methods um, focus at the moment um, towards emerging mycotoxins and not the regulated ones. We include them sometimes if it's necessary for combinatory studies. But um, uh, you, you may send me an email um, and I can try to, to make contact. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, if you can't find uh, Doris email, please send an email to us um, mm -hmm. and we will connect you. So thank you very much. Uh, we were over time, but I think that our conversation was uh, pretty uh, um, knowledgeable and uh, we couldn't stop just in the middle of it. Thank <laughs> you very much, uh, Professor Mikhail Markovic, uh, co-chair of GHI Chemical Food Safety Working Group and, and uh, um, professor from Institute of Biochemistry Functional Food Groups at Graz uh, University of Technology, Austria. And thank you, Professor Doris Marco from the Department of Food Chemistry and Toxicology at the University of Vienna, Austria, and also uh, Professor Franco Pedeschi, uh, co-chair of GHI Chemical Food Safety Working Group and uh, associate professor at the Department of Chemical and uh, Bioprocess Engineering and uh, Pontifical uh, Catholic University, Chile. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gerhard uh, Schlenning uh, for the technical assistance and for the lovely uh, work that uh, you've done with our webinars. And uh, thank you for the John Tang for helping us with the interactive posts. Uh, thanks go to all of our audience. Uh, thank you for being with us. And we hope we answer all of your questions. Uh, and if we haven't, please send us an email. Um, thanks for being again with us today. And see you on our next webinar at the end of May. Uh, stay safe, healthy, happy, and curious. See Bye. you, everyone. Bye. Bye.